Assalamu alaikum. alaikum. Greetings of peace. Uh, my name is Safir Ahmed. I um, oversee publications at Zaytuna and I serve it as an editor at Anabasho. It is my distinct honor to welcome all of you on behalf of Zaytuna College. It's nice to see everybody once again. It's warm. It's been a long time. We've had a gathering here. So, and I also want to welcome our people that are watching online. There's a large crowd, number of people watching online, so we want to make sure that we welcome them wherever they are, whatever time of day it is where they are. Thank you for joining us. Um, first things first, um, I want to, we'll begin with the Quran recitation, and uh, we're going to have some Zaytuna students um, doing the recitation and reading the English translation. The selection of verses is from the chapter 10 of the Quran from Surah Yunus. And the recitation will be done by a second year master student we have in the Masters in Islamic Texts, Hamza Hashmi. And uh, the English translation will be read by a senior student, Fatima El Imam. And uh, <clears throat> once we get, the, get done with that, I'll be right back. So let's start with the Quran translation. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الناس قد جاءتكم موعظة من ربكم قد جاءتكم موعظة من ربكم وشفاء لما في الصدور وهدى ورحمة للمؤمنين قل بفضل الله وبرحمته فبذلك فليفرحوا هو خير مما يجمعون قل أرأيتم ما أنزل الله لكم من رزق فجعلتم منه حراما وحلالا قل الله أذن لكم أم على الله تفترون وما ظن الذين يفترون على الله الكذب يوم القيامة إن الله لذو فضل على الناس ولكن أكثرهم لا يشكرون وما تكون في شأن وما تتلو منه من قرآن ولا تعملون من عمل إلا كنا عليكم شهودا ولا تعملون من عمل إلا كنا عليكم شهودا إذ تفيضون فيه وما يعزب عن ربك من مثقال ذرة في الأرض ولا في السماء ولا في السماء ولا 
أصغر من ذلك ولا أكبر إلا في كتاب مبين ألا إن أولياء الله لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون الذين آمنوا وكانوا يتقون لهم البشرى في الحياة الدنيا وفي الآخرة لا تبديل لكلمات الله ذلك هو الفوز العظيم ولا يحزنك قولهم إن العزة لله جميعا هو السميع العليم ألا إن لله من في السماوات ومن في الأرض وما يتبع وما يتبع الذين يدعون من دون الله شركاء إن يتبعون إلا الظن وإن هم إلا يخرصون هو الذي جعل لكم الليل لتسكنوا فيه والنهار مبصرا إن في ذلك لآيات لقوم يسمعون صدق الله العظيم Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of God, the most merciful, the most compassionate. O people, a teaching from your Lord has come to you, a healing for what is in your hearts, and guidance and mercy for the believers. Say, in God's grace and mercy, let them rejoice. These are better than all they accumulate. Say, think about, about the provision God has sent down for you, some of which you have made unlawful and some lawful. Say, has God given you permission to do this? Or are you inventing lies about God? What will those people who invent lies about him think on the day of resurrection? God is bountiful towards people but most of them do not give thanks. In whatever matter you may be engaged and whatever part of the Quran you are reciting, whatever work you are doing, we witness you when you are engaged in it. Not even the weight of a speck of dust in the earth or sky escapes your Lord, nor anything lesser or greater. It is all written in a clear record. But for those who are on God's side, there is no fear, nor shall they grieve. For those who believe and are conscious of God, for them there is good news in this life and in the hereafter. There is no changing the word of God. That is truly the supreme triumph. Do not let what they say grieve you. Power belongs entirely to God. He hears all and knows all. Indeed, all who are in the heavens and on the earth belong to him. Those who call upon others beside God are not really following partner gods. They're only following assumptions and telling lies. 
It is he who made the night so that you can rest in it and the daylight so that you can see. There truly are signs in this for those who hear. Thank you, Hamza, and thank you, Fatima. A uh, couple of quick announcements, and then we'll dive into the program, inshallah. Um, I don't know if any of you saw or walked into the bookstore when you came in, but uh, we have a fantastic bookstore, and Khadija O'Connell, whose project that has been from the day it started, she's here, and uh, we'll help you. I would encourage you to go out there and check out the bookstore after the program. It'll be open um, till at least 7 o'clock or later. Um, there's a prayer area for people who want to pray after this. Um, this downstairs, so when you walk out, go to your left, down the stairs. There are washrooms at both sides, upstairs and downstairs, for men and women. So, And uh, we have to express our gratitude um, today also to um, Mecca Books. They are uh, <clears throat> here, um, Arthur is here for Mecca Books, and they, this program has been a partnership with them. Um, to host this program tonight, so we're very grateful to them. I want to go on to tonight's program, and I think, you know, as obviously as you all know, it's about a, a major new publication um, that uh, was put together by Sidi Haroon uh, Sugic and uh, collaborating with the, the esteemed photographer Peter Sanders and having a lot of um, people writing about the saints and sages of, of our time. The title is Exemplars for Our Time. And it's an interesting thing, it's not of our time, it's for our time, which I think, um, if it was meant that way, it certainly we need it in this time and uh, this kind of wisdom from our sages. And exemplars is an interesting word. Um, I think exemplars is, you know, um, connotes somebody who's worthy of emulation a role model, um, somebody we can learn something from. And it also has a synonym, something like a, you know, a paragon. People call it about, use that term as well. And it's the reason why the phrase paragons of virtue is kind of a common phrase, because these are people who are virtuous people. And we'll hear a lot more about that tonight from both our speakers. Um, I just wanted to let you also know that when you go out, you can also order the book, the, pre the book set, pre-order it. Um, there's a, a QR code, I believe it's a little card. You can just put your phones on it, and uh, there's a QR code on the back, and that'll take you to the Zaytuna Bookstore website. You can order it. Um, and so on to the program tonight. It's a very simple program we have. Um, we have, uh, we'll first introduce um, Sidi Harun Sugic, Michael Sugic, and after that, um, uh, President Hamza Yusuf will join him up here for a conversation, and after that, inshallah, we'll have some time left over for questions from the audience here, and also the audience online. Um, I, before I bring up Sheikh Hamza, I just want to sh tell you that they are both, Sheikh Hamza and Sidi Sugic have been friends and uh, for over 40 years. Um, and so this is a long-term relationship and uh, we're finally um, blessed to be able to hear from both of them and in conversation. I'd like to ask Sheikh Hamza to uh, come and introduce Sidi Sugic. Please welcome President Hamza Yusuf. Assalamu alaikum. Wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira, alhamdulillah. First of all, welcome back. We, we haven't had any gatherings really uh, here. Is this the first one since the, yeah, pretty much. Alhamdulillah. So, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you, keep you safe sound the plagues are part of life it's very interesting pandemics i don't know if we've ever had anything like that in human history 
certainly not shutting down the whole planet. It's a very strange experience. But uh, traveling lately and um, just seeing how much changed because of these events. So, But inshallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, continue to bless us. For those of you who've been through COVID, very interesting. I mean, physically been through it. It's a very interesting experience. So the last time I, I saw Sidi Harun, uh, a few days later I got COVID. So <laughs> it was, had nothing to do with him. But um, we were at the Bradford Literary Festival, which is a literary festival in England run by Muslims, even though it's actually not a Muslim literary festival. It's, it's, it's a global festival, so people come from all over. But there's so many Muslims in Bradford, so they took it on, and I said that I was delighted just to see Muslims associated with a literature festival. <laughs> that was fantastic. Um, so we were there uh, to uh, launch this really unusual book. One of uh, the aspects of our tradition is something called tabaqat literature, which is biographical literature. It's a, it was a very important genre. And in, in, in the United States, if you go to any good bookstore, the biography section is actually quite large because biographies, are, they're fascinating. And people are fascinated by the biographies of people. I mean, almost everybody, if they, if they had the literary talent, could write an interesting biography because there's no life on this planet that's not uninteresting. Um, there are, quote unquote, ordinary lives, but they will still have elements of drama, uh, of tragedy, of comedy, of humor, of sadness, grief, joy, all of the things that humans go through, each one of us will experience many of those things, if not all of them. So, so I first met uh, Sidi Harun Sugic 44 years ago, and I was reading the Quran at the time. I had purchased bizarrely the George Sale Quran in a used bookstore which is one it's one of the it's the first serious translation of the Quran into the English language I mean there were ones before that but it, and it, it had very interesting notes also but that's the one that I was reading and the reason that that happened is because I had read a book called the book of certainty I'd had a pretty serious car accident and, and was thinking a lot about um afterlife, and I had, was studying uh, at a college uh, in Southern California. So I had a friend who was at uh, UC Santa Barbara, uh, who we'd actually gone to high school together. So, um, and I was telling this person about the, the Quran, what I was reading, and she said to me, oh, I just met these people from Mecca. And I was like, really? That's, that's where they pray. And, uh, and she said, yeah, in fact, the, I gave him my phone number. And right then the phone rang and I said, I know it's him. I know it's them. And lo and behold, it was. It just was really just a strong feeling that I had that it was, and it was, uh, Sidi Harun was inviting us to uh, an evening in Ojai, California. So he actually picked me up and we drove uh, to Ojai from Santa Barbara, and we spent an evening there. And they had just published a book called uh, Jesus, the Prophet of Islam. And I really wasn't that interested in that aspect because I had read, a, I had actually read a book called The Fellow in the Cap about Mithraism, and I had already come to certain conclusions in my own uh, life about Christianity. So I met him and I was 18 years old, and he was a young man. Now we're both old men. But uh, it was a very interesting experience because uh, the, f the first thing that happened was, you know, the, the men went into one room, the women went into another room, which was, that was obviously new for me being from California. And we started talking, and then the time for prayer came, and he said, do you want to pray with us? And I said, yeah, sure, I'd love to. And so I went out and did wudu for the first time under a really beautiful October sky. Um, 
in Ojai. And uh, we prayed and I pretty much knew I was Muslim at that point. I'd already decided that I wanted to become Muslim, but I, I didn't say anything because I didn't know there was some kind of formulaic thing that you had to do. So we went to LA and we were, I was spending a lot of time with him during that time. And uh, one day he said to me, uh, do you want to become Muslim? And I said, uh, uh, I thought I already, what do I have to do? He said, well, you have to say Shahada. And uh, so he had me go up and do a ghusl. And then, uh, and then we said Shahada. And, and actually, I realized later that uh, it wasn't a valid Shahada because there was only one, one, one and a half witnesses. <laughs> so I had to redo that. But uh, alhamdulillah. And, and we, we, uh, we lived together uh, in Monterey. We had a, a really beautiful place, did a lot of dhikr and study. And then I went to England. And, and then I came back and we spent, again, we met up in um, Tucson, Arizona and uh, different places. So over, t over time, uh, Harun was married to a, a wonderful woman from Mecca, Allah yarhamuha, Shadia, um, and, uh, who passed away. And she um, was the other witness for my uh, shahada. But uh, we've we've just kept uh, you know this relationship over the years, and it's I think one of the really profound aspects of Islam. I think one of the most interesting things to me about the Prophet ﷺ. I mean, there are, everything is interesting about him, but one of the most interesting things to me is that all the people that were with him at the beginning were with him at the end, and it's a testimony to who he was. Because false teachers always lose people. It's just there's always going to be people that break off, that are disgruntled, that are dissatisfied. But all the stalwarts that were there from the beginning were there at the end. And, uh, and so it's a great blessing to have companions in your life because sahba, and it's another thing that I love about our Prophet ﷺ is he didn't have disciples. You know, he didn't have murids or atba. He had companions. They, they were his companions. And when people came in, they didn't even know which one was the prophet because they were all luminous from his light. But he had companions. They were his companions, uh, the sahaba and sahabiyat. And, and, uh, and he treated them like that. He, he never treated them. He, he didn't, he, he, used to, he used to say, taqaddamu wa khallu zahri lil malaika. Walk ahead of me. He would always walk behind them. He, he didn't even allow them to follow him. He said, I like the angels to be at my back. <laughs> you know, we say, I've got your back. Imagine somebody who has the angels <laughs> has his back. So, uh, uh, Sidi Harun also introduced me to the whole concept of the, the awliya. You know, this idea that there are people, um, you know, when I got into my car accident, my, my older sister who was very interested in Sufism. Uh, I stayed with her in New Mexico and she was kind of in the fourth way and doing some things down there. But she told me that uh, people, she said, oh, you, you've had a, you've had a, a uh, she said, a nudging in your sleep. She said, because people are asleep. And she said, the only people that are awake, are that most of them are in North Africa. That's what she told me. I don't know how she came up with that, but that's what she told me. She said, like, like Morocco. And so uh, Sidi Harun introduced me to those people. He was the first person to really introduce me to those people. And he and I have been blessed greatly in knowing a lot of these people because the exemplars, I mean, the real exemplars are, they're just, they're, they're, they're very rare. And the Prophet ﷺ said that people are like 10,000 camels. You'll be lucky to find one that's really, really worth riding. 
And, and this is just a, a reality of life. So we all have to come to terms with our own mediocrity at some point in our lives. And the best thing we can do is recognize the greats of the past, honor them, and recognize as best we can the people of our time because they are always there, these people. And they're often hidden. They're not always scholars. Um, if they are scholars, and many of them have been, if they are scholars, they're certainly not pedantic type of scholars, and they're not people that um, their scholarship leads to a kind of arrogance or sense of superiority. But they are, um, they are always there because when they go, the world goes with them. And that's simply a, a fact. Um, they're the ones, if you can imagine how we came into the world, we, we had to have you know, only a certain amount actually get to the egg. They're all headed towards the egg, but only a certain amount get to the egg. And when they get to there, they, they, they start latching on and they start trying to get into the egg. But only one and rarely two get actually into that egg. And that creates this massive explosion. Some actually go the opposite direction. It's very interesting in, in the act of creation. Some of the semen actually goes in the opposite direction. And these are the people that turn away from the, the goal. So th those, those are the arifun, they're the ones that, that reach the goal. But we should all keep our eyes on the prize. So I, I'd like to introduce my, my brother, Uh, I'm not as 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 um, eloquent as as my brother Sheikh Hamza. I always feel out of my depth when I'm beside him, even though I'm uh, older. Um, so please excuse me. I'm going to read this presentation. Uh, it's better for me, and probably for you as well. If I go off off script. In earlier ages, the saints of Islam were the benchmark for what a human being could be. The village sage could have been a local imam, a jurist, a saintly woman, a shoemaker, tailor, or tanner, or a wealthy merchant. In the cities, there were sages that were well-known and sometimes celebrated, scholar saints with many thousands of disciples, and there were those entirely hidden. Many had great formal knowledge, and others were completely illiterate, but illuminated from within. They populated the mosques and madrasas. They took to the roads, traveling from town to town and country to country. They were master craftsmen who led the guilds. They were manual laborers, farmers, traders, shopkeepers, and school teachers. They were grandmothers who taught the Holy Quran. The aim of producing exemplars for our time, a series of nine illustrated books, eight of which are biographies of contemporary Muslim sages, is to revive awareness of these people who still exist by telling the stories of their lives. There is a rich tradition of Muslim biography, the tabakat literature, which inspired and educated Muslims from the earliest period of Islam, Yet this powerful teaching tradition has been all but lost to young people today. This is to a great extent because the notion of sainthood has not been sufficiently contemporized and the spiritual sciences that produced these saintly men and women and that were intrinsic to the practice of Islam have been marginalized over the last century or two. The first volume in the series is a general orientation to sainthood in Islam, explaining who these remarkable people are and why they're so hard to find these days. 
the luminous virtues of the sages of Islam describes the, the attributes, human and spiritual, of a saint in Islam, the nature of spiritual authority, and ways of identifying a truly qualified spiritual guide in Islam, which is a burning issue among young people today. <clears throat> this volume also addresses the question of why women sages and saints seem so few and far between, whereas in reality there are as many women saints in the world at any given time as there are men. There is no question that the sages profiled in this series were neither supernatural nor infallible. Our aim, in fact, is to present these beautiful human beings in all their humanity without romanticizing or mythologizing them. However, being human does not mean surrendering to immorality and evil. The suggestion in the academic field of exemplar studies that every exemplar must necessarily have an underside does not apply here. The whiskey priest or Tartuffian lecher do not exist in the particular universe we're exploring. The exemplars we're profiling are men and women who have subdued their lower natures and extinguished their egos through purification and by the grace of God. The life stories of these remarkable people are told against the turbulent backdrop of the 20th century. These sages were born in a world where Muslim societies had been subdued and subjugated by European colonial powers. They lived through the degradations of colonialism, world wars, revolutions, imprisonment, exile, and they witnessed the desacralization of their societies and deterioration of traditional values. Yet in spite of all that, each has left a lasting legacy of wisdom and teaching sorry, that continues to inspire generations of believers seeking a sane, balanced, tolerant, and compassionate way to live in a challenging world. Sheikh Murabit al-Hajj, who passed away in 2018 at the age of 106, was a Mauritanian ascetic scholar saint who would almost certainly have lived out his life in complete obscurity in the remote deserts of Mauritania were it not for a young Muslim convert from California who was guided in a dream to visit him, live in his tent with him, and learn at his feet. <clears throat> the young, we all know that the young man was Hamza Yusuf Hansen. Sheikh Hamza Yusuf has brought his close relationship and years of study with the Sheikh to bear in an immaculately crafted and moving biography of one of the hidden treasures of our time, illustrated with the unique photography of Peter Sanders. Habib Ahmed Mashhur al-Haddad was a renowned Hadrami scholar sage who immigrated to East Africa from South Yemen. During this period, while earning a living as a trader, he would venture out into the jungles of East Africa, calling aboriginal tribes to Islam and building schools, mosques, and clinics for these new Muslim communities he ministered to. Hundreds of thousands entered Islam through his teaching and influence and in his lifetime, he was considered to be one of the greatest saints of Islam. The author, Dr. Mustafa al-Badoui, has dedicated his life to translating and interpreting the teachings of his spiritual guide and his ancestor, Imam Abdullah ibn Alawi al-Haddad and the sages of the Ba'alawi way. Sayyida Fatma Yashrutiya, was the spiritual heir of her father, Sayyid Ali Nuruddin al-Yashruti, who, who was born in 1791 <clears throat> and died in 1899 at the age of 108. She was taught by her father in her father's Zawiya in Akka, Palestine, imbibing the spiritual teachings of her father and his closest followers 
until his death. After the 1948 war, Sayyida Fatma became a refugee, ending up in Beirut, where she resided for most of the remainder of her life. The Yashrutiya of Akka reconstituted themselves there with the help of its well-established adherents in the Zawiyas of Lebanon and Syria. This led to a spiritual renaissance in the order, aided and abetted by the remarkable books that were penned by Sayyida Fatma. Her biography, illustrated with rare photographs from private collections, is authored by Dr. Karim Laham, whose family has held a deep and abiding connection to Sayyida Fatma and her father's teaching for generations. Sayyid Omar Abdullah Muini Baraka was born in 1918 and passed away in 1988. He was a highly influential East African educator and diplomat and a charismatic interpreter in multiple languages of the tolerance and beauty of Islam. A towering figure in education in East Africa, he was the first educator to successfully synthesize traditional Islamic teaching with secular education and had a profound influence on many leaders of post-independence East Africa, including his student, Dr. Ali Muinyi, the second president of Tanzania. He was a galvanic orator and spiritual guide who elicited, <clears throat> who elicited love wherever he was. Muzaffar Ozak Effendi was born in 1916 and died in 1985. He was the 19th Grand Sheikh of the Helveti Jarati, Jarahi Order of Dervishes, who revived this spiritual tradition after the long suppression of Sufi orders in secular Turkey and was the first spiritual leader to bring its practice to the West. A colorful and charismatic teacher, Muzaffar Effendi nurtured his students with lively conversation in his bookstore, in cafes and restaurants throughout Turkey, on the streets and in his derga or, in, or dervish lodge. A deeply traditional scholar, he ventured out into America to introduce young seekers to the beauty of the way of Islam and the practice of Islamic spirituality and left a vibrant legacy from North America to Europe and the Middle East. The biography is written by Shams Friedlander, who was his close disciple and Khalifa, and features unique photographs by the author, who, by the way, is a truly great photographer, one of the best I've ever seen. Sheikh Saleh al Jafari was born in 1910, passed away in 1979. He was the Imam of Al Azhar Mosque in Cairo, Egypt, and lived in a small chamber within the mosque for over 30 years, never venturing out except to make the pilgrimage to Mecca or to visit the tombs of saints in Egypt. A descendant of the Prophet Muhammad, born into the spiritual tradition of the great 18th century Moroccan saint, Sidi Ahmed ibn Idris, Sheikh Saleh was a preternaturally gifted teacher who became a legend in his own time, in his own lifetime, for his galvanic discourses held every Friday in the courtyard of Al-Azhar Mosque, attracting huge crowds of people from all walks of life. The biography has been written by Dr. Samar Dajani, who was a student of the Sheikh's son, Sheikh Abdul Ghani ibn Salih al Jafari. Sufi Abdullah Khan was born in 1923 and passed away in 2015. He arrived in the city of Birmingham in the United Kingdom in 1962 with a mission. He had been charged by his spiritual master to immigrate from his native Pakistan to bring a spiritual path to the thousands of Pakistani immigrants who had come to England for material gain, but who were losing their faith and religion in the process. The 39-year-old retired soldier from humble origins left his family and everything he'd known up to that point 
and started a new life in a foreign land purely for the sake of God and his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whereas his compatriots had immigrated to Britain to make money, Sufi, Sufi Abdullah had come to rescue them from a life without meaning. By the time he returned to his homeland in the Punjab for a visit seven years later, wearing the same blue suit he'd worn the first time he arrived in England, he had single-handedly, by the force of his personality and against all odds, established a vibrant spiritual path and laid the foundations for a strong, orthodox, and spiritually oriented Muslim community in the industrial heartland of Britain. I'm going to conclude my introduction with a reading of excerpts from two of the biographies, beginning with the biography of Sidi Muhammad ibn Habib. In the Moroccan city of Meknes, along Boulevard del Hevul, which curves along the edge of the old Medina, a nondescript entryway gives out onto a long, inclined, weather-beaten, whitewashed passageway open to the sky. The passage leads up to a double door opening onto a stark, cavernous room covered in hasira mats and striped carpets. There was nothing ever physically or architecturally remarkable about the plain rendered brick and stone structure or the utilitarian interior decor. Yet in 1971, crossing the threshold of this empty space was to walk into a parallel universe, an intensely radiant world concealed by the daily rigors of worship, learning, and service, and revealed in circles of invocation in remembrance of God carried out within its walls. The light that saturated this unprepossessing edifice emanated from a single centenarian saint and his illuminated followers. This was the Zawiya, the Sufi lodge of the teaching Sheikh Sidi Muhammad ibn al-Habib. In 1971, this venerable scholar saint presided over his Zawiya as he had since 1936, when it was first established as a place for learning and the practices leading to the purification of the heart and the knowledge of God. He was 65 years old when he opened his Zawiya, the age when most men retire. He had now reached his centenary, and this would be his final year on earth. The Habibiya Zawiya served as the home of the Sheikh and a center for instruction and discipline of aspirants on the spiritual path of Islam. Sheikh Mohammed ibn al-Habib brought the full force of 19th century Sufism in all its rigor and purity into the 20th century and then over a period of 60 years guided generations of sincere seekers to the knowledge of God. That year, that year a handful of Westerners joined the gathering. Most were new to Islam, all were novices. Few had ever laid eyes on a saint, or for that matter, had any idea what a saint was. Suddenly, they were sitting in the presence of one of the greatest living saints of the age, and surrounded by other men who had attained stations of sainthood under his guidance. Imam Shazali, the 13th century Sufi master, was once asked why he did not write books he replied, my companions are my books. The sheer number of illuminated souls gathered that spring who claimed Sheikh Ibn al-Habib as their guide and their collective incandescence was testament to the majesty of this spiritual master. The power of the light from these men, its penetrating clarity, and the discipline and self-denial that produced it by the grace and mercy of God could be almost unbearable for the self-absorbed novice accustomed to the endless distractions and self-gratifications of the modern world. 
Here was a pre-modern world where the ego was the enemy and God was the friend. And according to the wisdom of the path, the only way the enemy could be defeated was to be occupied by remembrance and love of the friend. With relentless, single-minded intensity, the sincere disciples of Ibn al-Habib turned away from the ego and by remembering God at all times, aspired to lose themselves in the love of God. In the words of God enunciated by his messenger, my servant never ceases drawing near to me by supererogatory works until I love him. And when I love him, I become the hearing by which he hears, the sight by which he sees, the hand by which he grasps, and the foot by which he walks. Were he to ask of me, I would surely give to him. And were he to seek refuge with me, I would surely give him refuge. And now a final remark from Sheikh Hamza Yusuf's eloquent biography of his master, Sheikh Morabit al-Hajj. Murabit al-Hajj would appear to many in modern society to be a primitive, a simple Bedouin living in a tent. Yet his spiritual, emotional, and intellectual development should compel us to question our assumptions and see the shortcomings of our own civilization when compared to the desert culture that produced him. For this simple man was a grammarian, logician, rhetorician, theologian, jurist, judge, leader of a clan, father, husband, traveler, mystic, and a profound and pious human being. He may seem an anachronism in an age racing towards transhumanism and metaverses, though not metaphysics. In today's technology-driven societies in which computers mediate everything, our reality and our relationships, our financial transactions and our consumer choices, our memory and our history, and even our pursuit of knowledge and wisdom, we would do well to remind ourselves of what can be achieved without modern technology. Murabat al-Hajj lived an unmediated life governed by the sacred monotony of diurnal existence, telling time with shadows on the ground or celestial clockworks in the night sky. He learned, preserved, and transmitted ancient knowledge to others and contemplating and contemplated the meaning of being a fully realized human being in complete submission to his creator. Murabit al-Hajj was a simple and sagacious man of immense wisdom, an anomalously learned nomad, content and grateful for the gift of life, who used his time on earth to occupy himself with what concerned him and to share the gift of his vast knowledge to edify those around him. He had penetrated the mysteries of the world and its temporality and set his sights on a far greater, far, far more interesting arena of our inner world. May God sanctify his soul. And here ends my introduction. Thank you. I wanted to ask you something. Go ahead. I, could, I don't think I could have spent three days uh, in, in Tuaymarat, yeah. the way you spent so much time. What sort of, what effect did it have on you? I mean, did, 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 you, did you react? I mean, it's, it's almost inconceivable to me that you, one could come away with that without being completely uh, um, disoriented, even. Yeah, I you know I was I lived with the Mauritanians in the Emirates for um, four years, and 
I just got used to their lifestyle because they take it wherever they are. Uh, they, uh, Sheikh Khatri, when he was here, we brought one of the Mauritanian scholars here, and he, he lived here. If I will tell you a humorous story about him just to let you know who he is. Um, <laughs> he visited a quote-unquote Sufi Sheikh here, and, uh, and the Sufi Sheikh said to him, oh, it's so nice to see a fellow Sufi. And uh, Sheikh Khatri said, A'udhu Billah. He said, I, I, he said, I'm not a Sufi. And, and then he said, are you a Wahhabi? He said, A'udhu Billah. He said, <laughs> he said, well, then you're a Sufi. He said, A'udhu Billah. He said, he said, in my country, a Sufi is somebody who doesn't have a, even an atom's weight of the dunya in his heart. And he said, I'm an old man in America. That's the biggest Maybe. proof. I still have dunya in my heart. You know. But anyway, when he came here, he used to move with the sun in the room because the mm -hmm. Mauritanians move with the sun. So they never, they're always away from the sun. Mm -hmm. So when it rises in the east, because the, the tents are always uh, east to, uh, to west. So when mm -hmm. it rises in the east, they're in the west. And as it moves across the sky, they move to the other side of the tent. Mm -hmm. So he did that in his apartment. <laughs> you know, it's just... It, they, wherever they go, they, they pretty much take their, their, their way of living. And I think the thing that I, the biggest, one of the biggest gifts that I got from them is that you don't need anything to survive in this world. I mean, the homeless prove it every day, mm. you know, but, but they really are people completely divested of dunya. Yeah. I mean, everything they own is usually in a chest. Mm. that they put on a donkey or a camel. We moved three times when I was there because they don't, they're not nomadic anymore. Right. So, but during that, and one morning, everybody was just packing, and I said, what, what's happening? And they said, Marab Tarhad said, we're moving today. <laughs> and that's the way it was mm. um, because of the water tables. So they're, they're an extraordinary people. I think they're anonymously, they're the only really educated Bedouin in the world. I don't know of any other uh, Aboriginal peoples that are educated. And, you know, I remember once Marab Tarhaj was teaching about, you know, there's this whole concept of atomism in, in uh, Kalam. And he was explaining what they call the Jawhar al-Fard, which is the indivisible atom. It's the Greek atom. It's not the... Um, the modern atom, which can be divided, but it's mm -hmm. the Greek atom, the, this idea that it's the undivided, غير منقسم. And he was trying to explain to this young man who was studying, and he, was, he just didn't understand it. So he, he, he picked up some dust, and there was a ray of light. And he blew it into the ray of light, and you could see all the motes mm -hmm. in the light. He said, if the veils were lifted, you'd see the whole world like this. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. That was such an amazing demonstration. Uh -huh. Yeah. Ibn Habib uh, uses that same imagery in, right. in his in diwan. diwan. Yeah. Exactly. Uh -huh. Well, the motes are very interesting, yeah. and they are uh -huh. used haba. And the Quran says that in the end of time, everything will be haba manthur. It will just yeah. be motes just yeah. spread Allah. everywhere. Yeah. Allah. Yeah. Uh, when you when you went back to the west, I mean, what I was what very happened? disoriented when I yeah. came back. Like it took me because I went, you know, I left. I mean, you know, I, I, w I went from California to England first, mm -hmm. and then I went to the UAE, and then I went to west uh, to North mm -hmm. Africa first. I was in mm -hmm. Morocco and Algeria, was studying there, mm -hmm. and then I went to Mauritania, and the whole time period was about ten years. So when I came mm -hmm. back. I, it was just very strange to be yeah. back and to, and I, and I actually never planned on coming back. I mean, my, I made hijrah, like I, my right. intention was not to come back, but I, but I, I ended up coming yeah. back and, um, you know, life has its own, yeah. you, you just follow your, you know, uh, Ahmed Zarruq, he said, Salam uh, li Salma. You know, رحيث دارت وتبحري أحلى قدري سير رحيث صارت surrender to Selma and go where she goes and accept the winds of destiny and let them take you where they take you. Did you feel that you had to come back to the West or were you? I didn't. I mean, I just yeah, I didn't. 
yeah, I came back. I mean, my original intention was actually to study medicine and go back to Mauritania because there was so much medical need there. Mm. And that, that's actually was my intention. So I came back mm. and I worked with Hashem Sidat, who I think you knew. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for, so I studied with him for a couple of years and then, I, and then he asked, told me to go to nursing school. Right. So that was my original intention. But then there was, you know, one thing led to another here. Right. So I, right. you know. I mean, I've, I've heard stories from people, not necessarily those who went to Tuamarat, but who went into intense studies in Yemen and Syria and places. And when they came back, they were shaken by the power of this culture, this kind of huge, uh, Western culture, right. and didn't feel that they could sustain you know, themselves as Muslims. I mean, I've heard stories about that. You, 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 have you experienced I, I think Sayyidina Naqib al-Atas, who, have you met him? Sayyidina uh, Naqib in Naqib, Malaysia? Naqib, yes, yes, yeah, yeah. I, I spent so, some time. So, I mean, there. we knew him from back in the 70s. He, he, yeah, yes, he, he, he Because was, he came he, to he England. Came, came to England. But, so, I, you know, I started reading his things in like 78, 79. So mm-hmm. he had a big influence on my understanding. But, and I'm, I'm currently reading in the book club his secularism and Islam. But one of the things that he says, he, he differentiates between secularism and secularization. And he makes this argument that secularization is an ongoing process. And mm-hmm. that the Western civilization is a civilization that has, it has an inevitability mm-hmm. of complete what he calls terrestrialization of man wow. to, to, to yeah. take away the celestial you know desire in in uh, in Latin actually means of the stars yeah. you know it's it's human desire the eros is an impulse for the celestial it's not the terrestrial yeah, yeah. you know and, and and you see that even in in man's desire to penetrate the the heavens with material power yeah you know to, yeah. You know the conquered space traveler, yeah, yeah, to go to Mars, the, yeah, conquered right? the, yeah, the, the, yeah. The, so that that destruction of that inner pursuit is mm. is really what secular secularization is about, yeah. and yeah. and so this this culture, there's I think it's so difficult for young people because there's there's just so much ag- ag- against them. There's so much yeah. there, there's so many issues that are opposing them. However. The Quran makes it very clearly uh, clear that, I mean, one of the fascinating elements in the Quran to me is that it's always one person up against a mob. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 yeah. There's no rightly guided group in the Quran. Mm. They're always individuals. And, and the Prophet's companions were actually the only group that really is given, conferred that honor. Right. of being this ummah. And so I think the Prophet ﷺ told us that Islam began strange and it will return. And that's in yeah. Sahih Muslim. Ghurba is the feeling or state of being in the world when you know it's this is not your place where, where, where we're actually from. And yeah. that is the celestial pull. Right. And depression, you know, huzan, I mean, in the, in the verses, I was thinking about um, the verses that were read, you know, yeah. Allah inna awliya la mm-hmm. You know, the, Allah mm-hmm. says that the awliya are the ones that they don't, they don't grieve and they don't fear. And yeah. in the commentaries, they say grief is of the past and fear is expectation yeah, of, the of, the, of the future. So they're in the present and they're in the hub. And so I think the beauty of what you're doing with this is these people are there and, and they're there to, to guide, they're living guides because the prophetic legacy is always inherited yeah. and they're living guides. And, that, and that's what you see with them, they're in the hub, yeah. they're there yeah. and, and they're not in that, you know, what the, the Boethius called the wheel of fortune. They're not in that, um, Fear and hope and anxiety yeah. and yeah. yeah, they're 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 in a different space with Allah. So I yeah. think it's very difficult, but you know we have these challenges, and this is the beauty of community and and just having yeah. people sahba, 
you know, and the importance of finding good companionship. Yeah, this came up in Bradford, uh, and, and you addressed that very beautifully with the, the fact that each of the your, your, uh, sincere companions that you, that you develop over a period of time may not be completed in, in some way, but they may have a portion of something that they've, that they've uh, um, attained through their company with uh, people who are more complete. So it's not uh, a zero-sum game right. where, where you you have uh, you know the great shake and he and people think that they solve all your problems and it, it doesn't it doesn't work that way right yeah but I mean uh, when you came uh, you know I was thinking about Sufi Abdullah and you we, when you yeah, we both met him yes yeah, yeah. he was a <coughs> remarkable man he was very tall. And had bigger great, than life personality. Yeah, bigger than life. He had this great warm personality. And he would do, I, I did thicker with him all night once. And I was literally falling down. I was staggering out. And he was on his way to, I don't know what, go to work or whatever. Yeah, they did. went to work in the factory. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. he worked in a factory. And he worked, he worked 12 hours a day in a factory and spent the rest of his time. But he had this great sort of swaggering, you know, great he, he was such a, such a great character um, and um, I, I I was thinking about we, when we were working on his biography one of the things that I had no idea I mean he really came with nothing right and and uh, was a working man and the only thing he did was he had a little room uh, in in a house full of other um, Punjabi workers, and he decided that they weren't interested. They didn't know the qibla. They they'd forgotten the prayer. They they weren't doing anything. So he would just get up and do all the adhans and may you know he made his mosque the prayer. And he just kept doing that for mm. year after year after year and working twelve hours a day and just doing that. And he left his family. He didn't see his son till he, his son was seven years old. So the, the um, 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 immense sacrifice he, he made, and, and uh, you know, I had no idea about that. I, I saw him when he was, you know, they would the communities would come and they'd be having With all banners, the, flags, and, the banner, and yeah. you you point you mentioned uh, in Bradford, he was always feeding people, feeding constantly, and in fact, his sheikh assigned him to go every year on Hajj and feed people yeah. in in Hajj, but I was thinking you you. you when you came back and you started uh, Zaytuna way, way back, uh, it must have been a similar kind of experience. It must have been a little, a bit lonely, because when when we entered Islam, and it's interesting because um, I realized this this now, right now, it's 50 years. It was my first Ramadan Mashallah. 50 years ago in Berkeley. Uh, and, I, and uh, hmm. but um, there was nothing. I mean, there were no books. I mean, there were the the Luzak books, the Brill books. Well, the and, books, yeah. Uh, there were there was not much to read, and there were no real communities that you could sort of attach yourself to hmm. or learn from. So, I mean, uh, it must have been very difficult. I think a lot of people here just had, there, there were, to be fair, there were Diobandi scholars here, but they were very mm -hmm. isolated and kind of doing their own thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the majority community didn't know about it. So when I started talking about traditional Islam and mm -hmm. by traditional following a madhab, uh, following one of the sound creeds of Islam, and then a, a belief in Tasawwuf with the caveat, because I never promoted like turuq or any of those things, but but a recognition that tasawwuf is a core part of the religion. Like this idea that it's not, that it's some innovation is a very yeah. modern concept. Yeah. I mean, nobody in the history of Islam ever said that. Mm -hmm. The critics of tasawwuf are some of the biggest Sufis in the history of Islam. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, uh, it, uh, Imam al-Ghazali has a, a small, it's a really significant little um, risa that he wrote, which is called um, 
الكشف والتبيين في غرور الخرق يجمعين elucidating and illuminating the fact that all of, of humanity is deluded. And so he goes through each group and shows all their delusions. Uh -huh. And then the last group he deals with are the Sufis. And when he gets uh -huh. to them, he says, وَمَا أَعْظَمَ غُرُورُهُمْ And it's the only group he says that about. He said, uh -huh. these are the most deluded uh -huh. of all the groups. And then he talks about their thinking they've reached some haqaiq. Yeah. There's a great yeah. Zen story where the, uh, you know, this Zen master goes to this, um, Dr. Cleary told me this story, where he goes to um, mm -hmm. this monastery and, and, th and they've all heard about this. And this is a place where supposedly they're all enlightened. Right. But he goes in and his, his lecture was just, there's no such thing as enlightenment. <laughs> and they all leave except right. one. And he said, why are you sticking around? And he said, I've been here for years thinking I was enlightened. Now I'm wondering if it's just early senility setting in, <laughs> you know. And I think that, you know, that yeah. lesson of just yeah. that the real people of Tasawwuf are the furthest mm -hmm. from claims. Yeah. And that's why Sheikh Ibn al-Habib says in the Diwan, in shita tatiran min shirki wa da'wa. Yeah, the yeah. claim if you want yeah. f to be free of any claims, oh, you know, yeah. so, um, and that's something we saw in people like Sifal Dawla mm -hmm. al-Huwari, I mean, he was given idhan from Shaykh Ahmed al-Habib, but he told me, he said, who am I yeah. to, to do yeah. this? Um, mm -hmm. So I, th I think coming back was just seeing a kind of impoverished Islam. Yeah. Uh, that's how I perceived it, that yeah. it was, because once you go into these works, even non-Muslims spend their whole lives studying these people. Yes, yes. I mean, literally, like, yeah, right. because they're so fascinating. Like, right. they might not ever end up becoming Muslim, but they spend a lifetime right. reading their works because they're, they're just so incredible. Yeah. SubhanAllah. Um, what, we were, what we've been trying to do with, with this series is to reintroduce the, this, the uh, awareness of these people, but also to encourage others to take up this, the, this, the, this aspect of teaching right. through, through storytelling. And one of the frustrations that I, we had, or that I, I in, in particular had, uh, in the course of, of doing this project was finding people who could actually write stories, and I was I was really uh, I, may, I I mean I'm I'm kind of anti you know I'm kind of reclusive, so I, I don't go out and meet lots of people. But I really couldn't find that many people who who could actually tell a story and 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 uh, and, and write a biography. Um, and I'm I'm just wondering if am I just you know, are there, am I missing something or are there people. Are there people out there that I missed, or uh, are we in trouble? In, yeah, I think that? we are in trouble in that I think our community does not recognize the centrality of language. It's been yeah. a STEM community for a long time, yeah. and, which is important. I mean, engineering and medicine yeah. and these things are important, but but the the other side of the equation is the side that nourishes the soul mm. you know medicine treats the body engineering mm. just makes bridges and 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 builds buildings and things mm. like that which are again they're important and they're not to diminish the weight of those people um it's interesting in in ibn sirin and the the muhandis uh, al mm. ghani and abdis in his book on dreams he said if you see a muhandis in your dream it means the destruction of the world <laughs> He said, kharab al umran wa umran al kharab, the mm -hmm. destruction of civilization and the civilization of destruction, which I thought was interesting. Mm -hmm. But um, so we, yeah, writers, it's a craft, as you know. I mean, you, you've mm -hmm. spent a lot of time writing, and it's a craft. It takes a lot of time um, and, and a real commitment to, mm -hmm. to, to, uh, to writing. And great writers are not born. You know, they... There are people that are obviously talented more than others with language, but real, really, truly great writing is a, is is learned like like music is learned through practice and through yeah. real dedication. Yeah. So 
unfortunately, we don't have a lot of people that, right? Well, we have a big problem with the renovatio. I mean, uh, uh, Safir, who does a lot of the editing, and he's, he's a fantastic editor, but um, we get these articles that are just really poorly written, and yeah. they're academics. They, you know, they, they have PhDs, but they, they haven't ever learned how to write. So that's mm. a big problem. Telling stories is really important, and I, that, that's why I think what you've done is, is such an important, because these are real people. We met them, we saw them. Yeah. The, most of the people that we, you, you showed on those, we both met yeah. the majority yeah. of them. And, and they, they, you, one of the things about them is they live transparent lives. So yeah. that idea of the shadow, you know, Jung had this whole concept that the shadow develops alongside the other self, yeah. but these people are people that lived Marabd al-Hajj, his tent was open 24-7. Yeah. You know, yeah. there, was no, there was no shadow self there. Right. There was just, you yeah. know, a wise human being living right. a daily... Like, I could know wherever I was anywhere in the world, if I knew what time it was in, in Mauritania, I would know exactly what he was doing. Mm -hmm. The regularity of his life really, really struck me. Yeah. Uh, because... The thing about these people is they have a consistent practice. Their spiritual practice is just, mm. it's like Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayah, no matter where he goes, he's, a, he's one of the few people I know that works out air. He, he always does it according to the prayer because he wants to do the minimum amount of prayers in the air. So he always mm. you know, schedules his flights based on the prayer yeah. times. But he, I, he will always, wherever he is, between Asr and and uh, Aisha, it's just, it's, that time is just dedicated to his practice. Mm -hmm. And then between uh, before Fajr until Shuruq, it's just consistent. Yeah. Wherever he goes, no matter where. And all the Murabitun are like that. The yeah. Mauritanian ulama, they all practice that. It's something that really struck me about yeah. them. They're so consistent in that practice. And that's why I, I like that term sacred monotony because mm. It, you know, the, the word in Arabic for monotony is rataba, which is yeah. where we get ratib from. Ratib, yeah. The, yeah. The, 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 like it's, a word. Yeah, yeah it's that consistent mm. thing. And then the other thing that I think is consistent, and I know you had this experience as well, is that they're very real. And, mm -hmm. and, and Allah, uh, Allah says in the Quran, in Tawbah, He says, Ya yuhal ladina amanu, attaqullaha wa kunum as have taqwa, have this pious awareness of Allah, this conscientiousness, reverence for God, and be with the truthful ones. Yeah. And, and that sidq, mm. which is, I mean, the closest person to, to the Prophet ﷺ was called siddiq. Sid, yeah. Like that's the quality after the Prophets, yeah. the siddiqun are the next group yeah. that are mentioned in, in, that, uh, in that hierarchy. And so sidq is... That's what you, you get from them, is that there's just that real yeah. sincerity that you, it's palpable. Yeah. And the Prophet said, yeah. you know, we don't make any claims about, you know, who's, um, but, but we, 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 you know, we have these beliefs about them. And, uh, and then their hisab is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But they have these consistent things that are very interesting, even mm -hmm. though they come from, Malaysia and yeah, Morocco, yeah. it's amazing. The yeah. cultures are completely different, and yet there's these qualities that are constant. This is what struck me in putting together the, the, the books, the eight, eight biographies. And in fact, we, we, we commissioned more than that. We, we were intending to publish 12. And I'm kind of glad we didn't do it because it, it was so heavy. The books, as you know, phys physically heavy. Uh, three more would have made it really difficult. But um, they, the the similarities between these very different people, you know, the, with different backgrounds. But there were so many similarities. I mean, one one constant was the sort of awareness of death. I mean, right. the experience that you that you had, I had a, an experience like this when I was about sixteen, not a not a an accident or anything, but just this awareness awareness mm. of, of death, and uh, it, it really st struck me in in reading your 
biography of uh, Murabit al Hajj and also Ibn al Habib's. Uh, yeah, I mean, his, he became terrified when he was young of, of death and, and, try, and, you know, ended up really taking a spiritual path because of, of that, even though he was on the path of, of knowledge and ilm and fiqh and, and formal knowledge. Um, so it was, it, it, it's kind of, and one of the reasons that we uh, composed box sets, I mean, we could have actually published a single sure. heavy volume of, of, the, of the, all, all the books together, but we wanted people to, to, to take each thing, each story individually, but then read everything, because they're very easy to read. Right. So that they get a, a it's a world. It's, it, we, the, it's, we're entering a world of, of, of sanctity and, and, mm. and beauty, and yet it's very, um, it's very real. Yeah. You know, the, I actually, you know, I, I'm convinced somebody would do really well if they published all these great masterpieces in, in like that, mm -hmm. sections. Mm -hmm. Because they, they were all serialized when they, you know, Dostoevsky, yeah. all his books were serialized. Yeah, and, and, you know, Dickens, Dickens it was all serialized yes. in magazines. And, yeah. and so people would read segments. Now yeah. you get this giant, you know, 800 page tome, no, nobody wants to open it. Uh, yeah. you know, that, which is what, why I actually read the Quran with the Ajzat. Uh -huh. For the very same reason, because I, I, I well, I, when I was saw you last time, mm. you were doing that, and I thought I, that's that's what I need to get the yeah. next. Because it's just yeah. it's really yeah. nice to finish something. Yeah, and uh, people love. Say, yeah. yeah, it's it's why cleaning a room is so. Um, you know, yeah. it's it's just because most things in life take yeah. years right. to really accomplish, right. but you can do certain things. You get done in one day. It's really nice. The hardest thing I have is the, the this uh, uh, rataba. I mean, is is the the consistency, mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know. I'm I'm pretty disheveled in a, in a certain way uh, and disorganized, but um, I have a real hard time with that. And I I, I imagine that most people from our our background. May have it because we're so used to doing, you know, having a, something different all the time. And let's go out and watch a movie, or let's you know, take a vacation, yeah. or something. And these people never, never really well, did that, things like that. Yeah, and that was Pascal's. The you know the 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 problem in in, in the world is that people can't sit alone with themselves in a room. Huh. You know, and and yeah. I think the worst thing about the. Um, this technology is it doesn't allow for downtime. Mm. People are constantly going to it for entertainment and you know that 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 it's and it's very you know it's very addictive and and it can be also very fascinating. So it's it's very mm. seductive. Um, and I and I think increasingly one of the real challenges for people is is going to to be able to fight the uh the distractions. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the, if there was one word that really summed up the time we're living in, I think it's distractibility. Yeah. Um, and what's interesting is that in, in, the, in the Catholic tradition, uh, in, in, in our tradition, we call it ghafla, heedlessness, right? Yeah. And in the, in the Catholic tradition, they call it acedia, which is sloth. And, and it's, it's, it's the disease of our time. And mm -hmm. it's very interesting because it was, it was called the noonday devil. And, and mm. the, the, the monks, you know, they, they talked about this, the monk who's supposed to be praying in his cell. Mm. Uh, and then he'd go to the, the window to look to see if anybody was passing by. That that, that was the, the distraction. Right. And so I think setting aside time every day is really important. Even if it's 10 minutes, just mm. that time to read some Quran, yeah. to do some dhikr, um, and also some time to study. I mean, there's two, you know, there's a beautiful hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri asked him, 
من أشد الناس بلاء يا رسول الله. Who are the people of the greatest tribulation? And he said al أنبياء. And then he said ثم من. And then who? And he said al علماء. And he said ثم من. And he said al صالحون. And so that hierarchy of tribulation is very interesting. So the prophets have it the worst. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then the ulama, and when the prophet used that word, it wouldn't have meant what it means today, like scholastic theologians. It mm -hmm. really meant the arifun, you know, the people yeah. that, that, um, that, that knew reality. Um, and then the sadihun. In the, in the hadith where the Prophet ﷺ says, الدنيا ملعونتون so the whole world is cursed except and, and, and everything in it except the remembrance of God and whatever f uh, facilitates it mm -hmm. and then a scholar a teach uh, somebody who's learned and somebody who's learning mm -hmm. and so those two paths that the prophet gave his community the devotional path and, and the path of scholarship, th those are two paths. They're not mutually exclusive, exclusive in that one needs something of the other. Yeah, so you can't be a student of knowledge without having some portion for, for you know, the spiritual practice of devotion, even though that study is devotion. Right. And the Prophet made that very clear, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But the, 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 the accursedness of the world is the distractibility. And that's yeah. why, except for mm -hmm. what aids you in remembering God. Mm -hmm. So it's not that the world's cursed, it's the distractive mm -hmm. nature yeah. of the world because it takes people away from God. Yeah. And then life is over. And we're, we're yeah. here, I mean, we yeah. know we were young people yeah. not that long ago. Yeah. And you know, the young people in here, they're gonna see it's, it yeah. does go, it goes very, fast. Very yeah, fast. It, it, yeah. Go, it goes fast. It's fast, yeah. slow. I mean, there is an element to it where yeah. it seems like a long, long time ago in a galaxy far away when we yeah. first met. You know, yeah. so there is that that um, element to it. But 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 it does. When you look back and think mm. about you know, and then and then the time, the movement of time, mm. and the, you know, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace. Yeah. It's just it's it's really is these adding up, um, yeah. you know, uh, Elliot measured it in coffee spoons, in coffee spoons but for yes, me, it's yes. the juice. Yeah. Like, I'm like, what? I'm on juice 27? You know, it's yeah. like, what happened to the month? Allah. It's amazing. Yeah. Well, uh, my, one of my teachers, Muli Hashim Belghiti, who yeah, of course, yeah, Allah Yerham. Allah Yerham. Uh, he said to me, he said, do whatever you like, but you will regret every instant you have not remembered God. And you know, I think about that and I get chills thinking about That's that. That's the only yeah. remorse in paradise. Oh, yeah. It's know, the it's only a, thing yeah. that there's, there's no remorse in paradise except for uh, an hour that passed. Moment really, sa'a, it means a moment yeah. that passed yeah. without remembrance of Allah yeah. subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and I remember in, 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 in the period that I was describing in, in the, the biography of Ibn Habib, in the 70s when we came into the, the presence of these people, I, I went gray in, in about 15 days. People said, oh my God, you went gray. I was traumatized by these people because I was so used to thinking about myself all the time. Yeah. And I noticed actually in, in talking to young people, that it's everything, it's about themselves. My, I feel this, I feel that. And these people, the self was really not, not very important. Amazing. Their selves were not very important. Yeah. They were only interested in in dhikrullah, in, in ibadah, and, yeah. you know, and that that was very very difficult for me to sort of get my head around and and accept. So um, I ended up sleeping a lot during that period, and Abdullahim took pictures of me asleep. They had a uh, slideshow back in England, and so there'd be a picture of one of the aulia, and then there'd be a picture of me like <laughs> completely asleep. But it was the only way I could sort of, uh, you know, sort of keep my balance in, in, in that. But it's it is, is well when we yeah, yeah go ahead no sorry. no no you go ahead you go ahead.
No, you I cut first. You off. I apologize. Yeah. We were. I was uh, in in with Muhammad bin Qurshi. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was just the first time we went there. You know, he he. he this person, this old person, comes out and washes our hands, then brings us food, and and there were a couple of people sitting with us, and then and I said, "When's the sheikh coming out?" Yeah. He said, yeah, "That that was him." Yes, you know, yes. He, he was. He'd cook he was, the meat. He'd cook and do it. And I remember the second time I visited him, I I said to him, "You know, I came here once before," and he looked at me and he just started laughing, <laughs> and I. I kind of realized I hadn't come there before. <laughs> that was somebody completely different. Yeah. 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 So, and then we, when we left, I just had this incredible, this amazing. Yeah. He was like air. Amazing I mean, I just, man. He was uh, something. And again, he was someone people tried to make him into something he, he refused, you know, yeah. like a sheikh or... Uh, he, yeah. And he had a, he had a rule. I don't know if the, you were. Did you? How long did you stay with him? Just a few days. Oh, a few days. That was that's good because yeah. he, they had a rule at one point where you could only stay. Yeah, they had hours a lot of trouble from the government because of the government, yeah. and uh, that was true of wherever you went at that time. Yeah. But uh, well, it's interesting because I heard from one of the ministers in Morocco that. The word darqawa still gives like chills to some people in the, yeah. and p that's one of the things I think the miss about the these people is that they were kind of quietists, you know yeah. that they didn't. Yeah. But that when, I mean, these were the people that fought the French. Did right. you did you go to Sidi Saleh? Did you ever go there? Yes, I stayed there. It was uh, he was an ex extraordinary man. I, and I've I never have, been to a place like that. That that. Yeah. <laughs> It was the tents, the the tents, yeah. and um, we we came in, and they did, they did a word uh, that lasted three hours. Yeah. I think it was. An, an, both well, they ends had the Quran the tent, which was twenty four seven. Yeah, yeah. And then they had the Dalal Khirat tent. Yeah. So we yeah. we uh, we went. We, we turned up unannounced, and uh, uh, they looked at it, and I had everyone, you know, make the prayer of greeting, you know, of, of, of the mosque. And I, when I got up, I, I glanced over, and the old men were all going, they're okay, because they, you know, followed the sunnah. Right. And then we waited for, for, for a long period, you know, like uh, two hours or something. I thought, well, are they going to let us, to invite us to stay on, or do we, are we going to have to go down the hill again mm. and find a plan? Where, are they going to feed us, or what, what's happening? And then they took us around to Sidi Saleh, and Sidi Saleh was, he, he, I, the only image I have is Orson Welles in the Black Rose. You know, he was this magnificent figure with beautiful Incredible. eyes. Yeah. And I s said, we've come to learn the Im Imara, the, the Hadra, which, which was, the, they f famously did this incredible, it was like rock and roll, this double bounce kind yeah. of. And as soon as I said that, he went. Yeah, and started they, they all started. And Hassan uh, Barrett, I, I, I hope he's here, but yeah. if he's not. Is, if he, is he here, Hassan? Yeah. He saved um, my life in Timbuktu. Yeah. I know, I know. But Hassan was a young boy at that time. Yeah. And there were all these children, you know, in the back. Yeah. And their heads were shaved. And they, Hassan was <laughs> looking at them. But it was an amazing experience. Well, they did every Hassan. month they went up into the high atlas with the, yeah. the tents. Yeah. Because they were originally nomads. Um, right. But they had the furusiya. Did you, did yeah. you ever see that? Where well, they, we wanted to, to, to that yeah. was one of the things that we were supposed to be Guys, I, we with. stayed up, I stayed almost a month up there. Really? Yeah, it was incredible. Mashallah, mashallah. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, um, but they showed us where they were shot by, you know, they had hats with bullet holes in yeah. them and from the French, you know, so they, yeah. I mean, they fought, you know, people yeah. forget that, like that whole North African region, they right. fought, but. And, and you know they characterize these these battles in. You know, I had to do some reading on on this, as tribal. Uh, you know the the tribes were up, 
against the French. You right, know, fighting the French. Arif, yeah. But they were all they were all in uh, Turuk. They yeah, were they were all. Yeah, absolutely. And they fought, yeah, and they really yeah, fought hard. Yeah. But they weren't. They didn't have this concept of terrorism, or like once they lost, yeah, they they submitted to the thing, and yeah. then they prayed that Allah would just get rid of them. Yeah, they didn't yeah. have this idea of subversion, like yeah. that you you could, you know, do these kind of terrorist activities. And I remember when I met Abdul Hayyar Amrawi, I asked mm. him why was Sheikh Ibn Al Habib put on the list of traitors by by mm. the. Um, uh, by the, the, you know, the kind of, uh, you know, political Islamists. Yeah. And he said, yeah. because he could see with the light of God, yeah. and he knew who the real traitors were. So it was yeah. just kind of a, it yeah. was very interesting. Well, uh, I heard a story that he was in, actually instructed by the Shuyukh, because he went out, and this was something that it took a lot of back and forth research about him because there, there, there are very few records that are, you know, um, I mean, they're, they're, they're scattered all over right. the place in, in villages and in individuals. But, and he, um, he, he, he went out alone uh, uh, to join the, the, the um, jihad. Right. He had no skills at all. And he hired a soldier to train him in, in how to swim, how to ride a horse, yeah. how to sh you know Amazing, how to yeah. wield a sword, and so on. Um, but he when he uh, he he went to Maalainain and the great you know yeah. these, these great um, his sheikh was uh, actually a Mauritanian. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Shams. Uh, yeah, he was uh, from the Gulfia. Yeah, yeah. Um, so he he knew all these people, and they knew him, and they knew that he was a man of of deep knowledge. Yeah. And they what I the the story that apparently he told someone was that he was sent back by these people to go back to Fez because the French were on the verge in 1912. They 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 actually occupied Fez, and they wanted him to be there to you know protect the dean. And, yeah. And then yeah. Muli, Muli Abdul Hafiz, I mean, he he yeah. accepted their, yeah. you know, that it came under the French protectorate. Yeah. So then they were told to stop. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And and that's why they followed the, you know, and Muli Abdul Hafiz was a scholar. Yeah. He, he, the king at the time, he was a yeah. real scholar. I mean, I have his uh, edition of the, the, uh, the Muatta, that Imam mm. al-Baji's commentary yeah. on the Muatta. Yeah. I have the original edition, Mashallah. which I got in Medina. I used to go to this bookstore every day, and I didn't have enough money when I was living in Medina. I was studying mm -hmm. in, 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 uh, with the Mauritanians. And uh, I used to go to this bookstore to read this book every day right. after Asr. And finally, this, the book dealer said, are you going to buy that book? He said, because I was coming yeah. every day to read it. I said, I can't afford it. And he said, Bismillah. And oh, he just gave it to me. It was an expensive book, yeah, too. It was, it, it was printed in 1914 uh, in Morocco. Yeah. Al Baji Al Mwata. And that, uh, yes. <laughs> I, well, I was just thinking if, if anybody wants to, you want to yeah, answer some it's questions really, and then. Because I'm back and forth yeah. enough. You know, it's we could go on listening to both of you for a long time. <laughs> beautiful <laughs> conversation and stories. Well, yeah, I, but I, we I, love, I love also spending time with Sheikh Amsi. I know. <laughs> we've <laughs> learned something. It's beautiful, mashallah. Thank you for that. Um, I'd like to um, open it up for questions for people. I think we'd, we're going to take, um, there's a microphone here. If people in the room can come this way into the microphone, um, and then we'll take some questions online as well. We'll kind of rotate if you can. And uh, I'll, uh, so, so anybody with questions can come up here, but I'll take my privilege to maybe uh, start with a question for both of you. Um, one of the things you all mentioned, which I am, uh, is about kind of the daily practices, and you talked about distractibility, you talked about rituals, um, you talked about a monotony and, 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 and discipline. Um, I'm curious what you think are the biggest impediments to you know, spiritual growth. What, what, what should we, for the rest of us, what kind of advice should, would you, do you think we should have? What you've learned from the sages yourselves? Mm -hmm. And uh, so just to help us with 
two or three things. What, 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 what should we be worried about? What should we be vigilant about? But, well, I, one thing I think is that people are, um, we're, we're all so uh, accustomed to um, uh, entertaining ourselves and, and making ourselves happy all the time. And uh, I think that's, that's a, especially in this, this society where there's so many opportunities to, to be distracted and to, to um, self-indulge all the time. And I, I think that's a, re that's a real problem now for people because they just don't want to give up. I remember when you, you started, when you were young, you went to someone, uh, like, a, a, I can't remember who it was, and you came back and said, I, you know, I told him about Islam and he agreed with everything. And I said, well, that's, that's, not, I, that's not the problem. The problem is he doesn't want to give up his tennis or, you know, his lifestyle. Right. And I, 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 I think that that's still the case. People, uh, the, I, in fact, in, uh, uh, I was sent a young woman at AUC. She was uh, visiting Egypt or, or a student or something. And she was interested in Islam, but she said, and she, she was in her tw 20s. She said, yes, but I still want to have fun. You know, and right. I, I, I couldn't figure out what, that, what exactly she meant well, by that. Well, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, my dad used to always say that the, the old English word fun is defined as the activity of fools. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah. I, I, I remember once she Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayah, his son, because he sees people all day long that have problems. And one of the things in the Matara, it says that if you don't have problems, then your role is to help other people resolve their problems. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do that, Allah will bring you problems. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, his son said to him, can't we just have one day without problems? <laughs> And Sheikh Abdullah said, Azil al kibrak min qalbik. Get that arrogance out of your heart. Mm -hmm. He said, Do you think the prophets ever had a day without trouble? Yeah. And that's again gets back to that that the people of the greatest tribulation are the people that are closest to yeah. Allah. And that's the nature of the abode. Mm -hmm. And and one of the biggest problems for human beings is not recognizing the nature of the abode. Uh, it, Ibn Atayilah, he says that the al-faqat a'yad al-arifin, that calamities and tribulations are the eids of the people that know God. Uh -huh. Because they know that that's the nature of the abode. Right. So, so they, they take them as opportunities. And the Prophet uh -huh. said that none of you's belief will be complete until he sees tribulations as blessings and blessings as tribulations. Yeah, yeah. And that's very hard for people to get their heads around because people want everything to, to be yeah. nice. And, right. and that's not the abode we're in. Right. That's, yeah. that's the next abode, inshallah, yeah. if you acted accordingly here. So I think the biggest problem that we all have is our nafs, you know, that the Prophet Sallallahu said, your worst enemy is the, the nafs that resides between your two sides. And, you, and we have the seven, the, the spiritual path is a progressive path. Nafs al-Amara, Nafs al-Awama, Nafs al-Mulhama, Nafs al-Mutma'inna, Nafs al radiya Nafs al mardiya and then Nafs al-Kamila. And, and the people we met, we saw that, we saw some of them that arguably ha had reached yeah. that so it is possible. And I remember Murabd al-Hajj told me something when, when I was reading Ibn Asha with him. And it said, That he struggles with his soul for the sake of Allah. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and he adorns himself with the stations of certainty. When we got to that line, I said, what if you're like you struggle and then you just keep falling back? Yeah. And he said, that's the struggle. Uh, yeah. Like that's th that's what you have to do. And I and I was with Sheikh Abdul We were in Kuwait in an airport, and this soccer team, one of the professional soccer teams, came in, and one of the the soccer players came up to. Him. He saw he was dressed and looked very you know sagely, and he came up and he said, Sheikh, you know, let me can I ask a question? He mm -hmm. said, Go ahead. Mm -hmm. He 
He said, you know, I have iman, but I keep doing things. And then astaghfirullah, I ask Allah forgiveness. And then, and then I go back and I do them. And then I ask Allah forgiveness. And uh, what do I do? And, Sh- and Sheikh Abdul just said, istimir, keep going. Keep going. Yeah. Yes. And I think that's one of the things. Ibn al-Munkadir, who was the great teacher of Malik, he's one of the great uh, fuqaha of Medina, he said, I fought with myself for 50 years until it finally surrendered. Yeah. And I think that's you know, one of the things the Taoists say. The reason the Taoists are so obsessed with health you know, they, 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 they do a lot of like all these qigong and things yes, to yes, cultivate yes, health. Yes. Is they say you owe it to your soul to live at least 70 or 80 years because that's how long it takes it. to get ready to go to the next. Yeah, yeah. So this is an opportunity, right. you know, and, and it's a carpe diem opportunity. Right. You know, right. it's, it, if, if, if we don't see it as that and just recognize. And, the, and the, the best thing that you can do is prayer on time. Yeah, I mean, uh, yes. that is the single best yeah. thing. Yeah. And try yeah. to have more presence in the prayer, yeah. to try to focus as best possible, to make it better. It, it's, you know, people, a great musician or a great writer, or who, they just practice. I mean, when mm. you see drafts, you know, like Brian mm. Garner says, his, the books he writes go through about 80 drafts. Yeah. Yeah, you of know? course. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. and these great musicians that show up in, I mean, they just practice and practice till mm-hmm. they get to that point where they can play it right. flawlessly. Right. Well, that we forget that that these daily rituals that we do, they're practice. And they're practice, yes. It, it's it's to get better at it. Right. So every day is just another day to try to hone our yeah. presence more. So I think those, and then there's a baseline. Everybody has a baseline of practice, yeah. and then you build on that. So the, the, the most basic baseline is just belief in Allah, the five prayers, and avoiding the haram. Yeah. And then you just build on that. I mean, yeah. there's a hadith, whoever prays four of nafila before the hor and four after, the fire will never touch them. Allah. You know, so that's a worthwhile practice. Yeah. And, mm. and people that do those constantly. Yeah. They're gonna, or the one I really adhere to is um, the Prophet Sallallahu said, whoever recites Ayatul Kursi after every Fard prayer, there's nothing between him and paradise except death. Uh-huh. And so just like, that's a practice. Yes, just doing yes. Ayatul Kursi. If you don't do anything else, just doing Ayatul Allah, Kursi. Allah, Allah, you know, Allah. one of my teachers, uh, uh, Sheikh Hamad Amr al-Wali, who I lived with um, in, a, in a beautiful mosque in uh, Al Ain, he said to me, If you leave everything except the five prayers, don't leave. Three times in the morning, three times in the evening. He said, Just don't lo- lose that one. And the Prophet he, he was constant in his remembrance of Allah. Yeah. And one of the things we're doing uh, for, uh, for um, the Mawlid, we're calling it the mindful messenger. Because this, you know, mindfulness is this big yeah. buzzword. But mindfulness came from a Sanskrit term, sati. Uh, sorry, mm-hmm. it's a Pali term. The sati term is shmirti. But the, the Sanskrit term was translated by this Professor Davis, Davids from uh, England in 1881 from Buddhist tradition as mindfulness. So that's where it came. It came from Buddhism. But mm. the original meaning was to remember the, the scripture. Uh, so it was dhikr. It was dhikr. Yeah. And so the, the, one of the things about the prophet that is amazing to me, yeah. and I think it's one of his great miracles, he had a prayer for every single human activity. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a path. Like if mm. you do the baseline of those prayers every day, just coming, I mean, going into the bathroom, <laughs> going in with your left foot, that's mindfulness. Yeah. And then coming out after you, with you know, you, you're, you free yourself of that, those toxins. <laughs> Praise be to the one who gave me the delight of its, the pleasure of its taste, retained in me its benefits, its power, right. you know, its quwa, 
and then remove from me its harm. I mean, what a perfect dua. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, and Marab al Hajj told me, one of the first things he told me, he taught, taught me that dua, and then he said, say, uh, Allah says about Sayyidina Nuh uh, that he was Abd Shakur, he was always grateful. And Asawi, he, Marab al Hajj mentioned to me that Sawi says that he always thanked Allah every time he urinated or defecated. Like yeah. that was his constant gratitude. And just people don't think about these things, but yeah. you know, there's all these blessings. Exactly. I mean, in terms of the interaction you have with the teachers we've been, we've been talking about, uh, this, is, this is how they address uh, issues. They give you uh, something from the Quran, something from Hadith, right. a dua of the Rasul. They don't, it's not some sort of magical transaction where they pass their hands over you and right. everything. They, they, you have a problem, they, they give you a, a something to deal with it because we know. It's one the, did you meet uh, the, the Sidi Muhammad Sahrawi from Bahlil? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Amazing. I mean, he, he was said, there. We got a picture of him. Do we? And, and there was a picture. He, yeah. He was yeah. blind. He was blind. Yeah. He yeah. was amazing. He was an amazing man. But and he said and the this, way he sat. You know, yeah. He, he just was had upright this, and very, yeah. very strong. Uh, and he has this massive tusbi. You know, it's like yeah. unbelievable. He had over a hundred sheikhs. Oh, over a hundred. Yeah. 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 He, he yeah, was when yeah, I met him. He was he was over a hundred. I knew. Uh, yes. Yeah. I he I knew that when. Yeah. But he said this amazing thing. He said, the sickness of the human heart is what shall I do? Right. And that, you know, if, you th if one thinks about it, we know every, what to do yeah. if we go back to the, to the, to the Quran and the yeah. Sunnah. Allah Akbar. We, we, but anyway. That's good advice. Thank you. Uh, we have a questioner here, I think. Yeah. Go ahead. Come here. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you so much for illuminating our hearts and really watering the drought that we're in, both physically and metaphysically. Um, my question is about um, a word that we, I heard, inshallah, um, mashallah, a lot of talk about sincerity. Um, and really the new buzzword that's out there is authenticity and people living their authentic lives. And I really find it like a fascinating word because growing up, um, we were taught to be sincere. Um, and uh, that's kind of a dying word right now. Um, and um, mashallah, these awliya, they seem to live their quote unquote best lives, right? They're the best versions of themselves. And um, my question is, um, as Muslims, what's our approach to living an authentic life versus a sincere life where um, authenticity, uh, with authenticity, our actions flow from our feelings uh, but with sincerity, our feelings flow from our actions and this shift that we're having socially towards living authentically versus with sincerity. And I hope that made sense. <laughs> I don't see the difference between yeah, no, sincerity so. and authenticity. Yeah. Uh, it's, it, it's to me exactly the same thing. Yeah. Um, maybe I'm not understanding uh, the question. I, yeah. I, I, no, I mean, I, yeah, I agree. Yeah. I, I think... Um, so it, it, you really can't be authentic without being sincere, right? Well, yeah, and I don't... I, th I think if it's real, you're not thinking about these things. I mean, I yeah. think it's, it's just... You know, Imam Manik was asked about a man who sets out for the masjid sincerely, but then on the way he hopes somebody sees him. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, I hope he gets the Nia that he has started with. Yes, yeah. You know, so I, I mean, I just, I think if you're thinking about being sincere, you're in trouble. And, and if you're thinking yeah. about being authentic, I think you're in trouble. But, you know, uh, th there's also a principle uh, operating in, in, ter in terms of... of uh, uh, ibadah and dhikr and, and the practice is that you're not automatically going to be sincere right. every, in every uh, prayer and every you, you, you go through it because you have to do it yeah. and um, uh, the, I, I've read Ibn Atayla talks about tadhakir 
which is a, when you're asking Allah for something and suddenly you're talking to Allah, you're speaking because right. you... And he said, uh, he wrote, that this is more important than getting what you're asking for, right. is to have that direct uh, conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So He that, actually thought, I mean, he he's goes against the uh, the majority of scholars about this, but he actually thought du'a was merely to to display abasement before Allah, that it was not uh, to get any answer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like he, he said, thought that that was the practice. Yeah, yeah. he said that's way more important. Yeah. Uh, and I think, uh, and you know, we, were, we talked about this before, Imam al Uzai, who was a great... Right. Uh, one of the he had a, a, a madhab, yeah. and which kind of faded away because it was so um, strict and yeah. difficult. Yeah. And one of the things that uh, I was told um, was that he that that if you if if you you had to have at least one moment of khushua of it, awe, yeah, one just one in in, yeah. in a prayer. That's, but if you didn't, but that's. Yeah. That's hard. That's, yeah. And if you didn't have, you had to do it again. You had to do your prayer again. Yeah. So it, it's this idea of you do it and then until something sinks in and you, it becomes, the, the, you, you have a moment of, of, of yeah. sincerity. In fact, yeah. some of, because you are supposed to have at least one moment of, and yeah. Ahmed Zarruq says, Try to make it at the outset of the prayer, yeah. like to really bring God's awe before Allah, you, Allah, so that when you open with the takbir, at least yeah. you had a moment of yeah. presence yeah. with, with yeah. Allah. Yeah. yeah. We'll try and get a question from online. Haroon? Thank you. Um, I'll try to get two quick questions in, at least from online. The first is Are there any invocations to ask to meet the sage and righteous people in our regions? And also, how do we fix the problem of the lack of intellectual minds in present times? Thank you. Muni al Arabi al Darqawi said that Man akhla salilahi arba'ina yawman sayalqa man yuwasiruhu ila Allah wa lahu fi ard al Nasara. And he wrote that 250 years ago. He said, Whoever is sincere for Allah for 40 days straight, he will find the one that will guide him to God, even if he's in the land of the Christians. So again, it gets back to just uh, sincerity. And then also, there's a, uh, a tradition that the, the awliya are called the brides of God, ara'isullah, wala yara al-ara'is illa al-muharamun. You know, the, the only people that are allowed to see the bride are people that are related to the bride. Yeah. And so Imam al-Ghazari says, the, the lowest station of wilaya, every believer is a wali, by the way, and, and that should mm -hmm. be an assumption, because uh, there's degrees of wilaya, but Allah is waliul ladina amanu, so every believer has wilaya. But the, there's wilaya amma and wilaya khasa. And so the, 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 uh, the wilaya khasa is something that Allah has hidden in his slaves, but we see people and we, we have a good opinion of them, like these mm. people. In mm. the end, only God can judge people's hearts because mm. even the devil doesn't have access to the heart. He can whisper to the heart, but he doesn't know what's in the heart. The angels don't know what's in the heart. Only Allah, the angels only record actions. Mm. Only Allah knows mm. the human heart. That that's God's mm. domain and it belongs to nobody mm. except God. So, but sincerity is just, that really is the, the key. And Qadi Abu Bakr ibn al-Arabi, he says, لَقَدْ وَقَفَتَ السَّمَوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضِ The heavens and the earth stood up in, in fear when they heard Allah say, وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ مُخْلِسِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ They were only commanded to worship Allah with sincerity and making the religion solely for Allah. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a real challenge, but we have a lifetime to try to get there. Um, Okay, I, we have another question. I, I haven't prayed Asa, so I'm gonna. Do, do, do you did yeah, travel? Yeah, I did yeah. travel. So if That's people okay. want to go on, I'm fine. I just need to go pray. Let's let's keep going as long okay. as anyone wants. Okay, we have a question to, here. Come on. I'll do my best. I'm like a. Salam alaikum. Waalaikum salam. I have a question about biographies. Yes. I was just wondering what constitutes a good biography. Could you? 
Well, I, I think one of the things that, that characterizes great biography is deep research. I mean, really profound research. And unfortunately, uh, in, the, in the modern times, this, this whole idea has been lost. And people, we Muslims don't, uh, and we found this with with the um, subjects that we were that we were chronic, chronicling. Um, I mean, these are very small books, and they are by design that way so that people can read them easily. But uh, 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 it would be very very difficult to do a full biography of most of of the the. Um, the, the people that we that that we profiled, because there isn't research, you know, there the the um, the the documents and manuscripts and things like that are scattered all over the place. It would take an enormous amount of time. How, having said that, like Dr. Mustafa Badoui has written a, a complete biography of Habib Ahmed Mashour al Haddad, and uh, and he very graciously. Agreed to, you know, take some some of that research and uh, and uh, contribute a biography, a, 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 sm a, a small biography, for us. Uh, but you need a deep research, and you need to be able to tell a story because people's lives have a meaning, and uh, if you, you and there's a drama in in, in everyone's life. It's just that people don't know how to, they don't know how to relate that drama. And it's what, we had to reject five, five texts for different aulia because they just, the, the, the scholars didn't know how to tell a story. You know, you, you, you need to make people want to read, you know, what's going to happen next in their lives. Uh, it's, it's not flat factu factuality, it's, it's a story. And it begins with birth, the birth, or even before birth. So you need to do a lot of research and have that, uh, have that. And and doing a, like in in the in the West, biographers are some of the highest paid writers because they, they when a biography of a of a of an eminent person in, is 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 written. It becomes a, a standard text, and it stays on the shelves for years and years and years and years. But it also takes an enormous amount of time to actually create a biography from from uh, the the research. You have to spend years in the, in, in in libraries. The, uh, I can't remember his name, but the the author of the two uh, Pulitzer prize-winning biographies of, uh, to, of Lyndon Johnson. I can't imagine spending so much time thinking about that guy, but anyway. Um, he, uh, he, he spent something like 20 years studying his life, going into libraries and ferreting out all kinds of in, in, interesting information. So that's really very, very important. But I would really encourage any uh, uh, aspiring writer to look at biography and think about it. We need writers uh, as Muslims, and, and and we need storytellers. There, we don't have enough, and uh, it's very important because this is what people become engaged by. This, if you only have um, uh, scholarly texts that you that you you. Um, read only things like that, it, unless you're a scholar, uh, you, you, you'll give it up eventually, because it's, you, you, we, there's something in us that wants, that's our entertainment. It should, this is, should be our entertainment, not watching uh, uh, TV sh shows and movies and all that kind of thing, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I hope I answered your question. Yes, you did. Thank yeah. you very much. Thanks. I think it's a good point you said about research that eventually leads you to be able to tell stories based on yeah. that research. Yes, right? and, and yes. find the meaning. What's fascinating is that each life has a, has every life, every single person's life has meaning. And to be able to look at the arc of uh, life and see wh where, it, where, it, where it began, where it ended, uh, is very is 
it's just breathtaking. And this is true of even just even ordinary people. Everybody has an amazing story. Let's get another quick question from online, Harun, if you have it. Thank you. Are the saints the happiest of people? If yes, how do we reconcile that with the hadith that the closest people to God are tested the most? And I think related to that is this question, what criteria and references were followed to choose the exemplars in these volumes? Thank you. Okay, that's two, two, two different questions, questions there, okay. yeah. Um, Maybe you can start with the, with the one about what... Come and save me. <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you can address yes. uh, Siddhartha, um, the question of what, what process you used to arrive at these nine uh, yeah, the, biographies. The, the, the process, well, first of all, we had to, we, we had to find uh, individuals who, we, that we knew we would be able to find at, at least... Um, a minimum of, of information on their lives because most of these people they, they there's 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 no no um, uh, records kept right. of, of these people uh, and it, it I mean like we know everything there is possible to know about Shakespeare that you know that and and not very much was known but there are volumes and volumes of material written about Shakespeare and the time that he lived in and so on. We don't have that with pe people like this, and they didn't want to be known. Um, Muli Hashem, uh, Belhiti's father, was an incredible man. And I, I asked Muli Hashem, I said, I'd like to do a, a, a monograph on your father. Mm. He said, no, he didn't want to be known. He, he just did not, he doesn't want that, and he refused. Yeah. Um, so that you, that was one of the criteria we had to, uh, and, and we also depended so much on the authors. Um, without the authors, we couldn't have done anything. And as I said, I had to reject five texts because they were were not um, they were not they weren't interesting. There were eminent scholars who were sincere, understood the the, the brief. And just they just couldn't write, you know. They they wrote academic style language. There was no drama. There was no, no no trajectory of their life. No you know no insights in, into anything. So um, that was the, the second thing. The other thing that was very critical is that these were books that were visual and literary. Uh, and and P Peter and I spent a lot of time working through. Ma the images, matching the images with the text as much as we possibly could, and so we we in the in the in the case of Sheikh Abdullah Al Humari, who was in a really interesting interesting Sheikh, and I think you must have, you met him. I, I I didn't meet. I met Hassan Al Humari, and I yes, did actually Hassan meet Abdullah. Yeah, I didn't I'm, meet Ahmed. Yeah. yeah, no, he had brothers. passed away. There, yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, there was Abdulaziz as well. Yeah, uh, and I met she Sheikh Ahmed briefly, and he, he he wasn't very friendly, I have to say, at the time for some reason. But I I stayed with Sheikh Hassan at one point. But he, um, we didn't we couldn't find enough uh, material. material visual material. We had we had his story. Um, it was it was thoroughly researched, but there were no pictures. We, we couldn't, I mean, there were ter a few terrible snapshots and Polaroids and mm -hmm. things like that, which were unpublishable. Yeah. So that was, the, uh, that was a, a very important third criterion. And the other thing that we mentioned is that they all had to have passed away. We didn't want um, to, to um, give the appearance that we were canonizing people while they were alive. Uh, it, 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 uh, it's tricky to do that. Right. So I think that was basically it. It was having the material. The, and also, we knew that these, some of these people were, were, they had communities that knew them uh, uh, and, and that would have been interested in reading about, about the, their, their. The one interesting thing that, uh, that, that took place in, this, in, in, in the research on Sufi Abdullah 
was that his family was very helpful. They, they gave us all the in, like, detailed information about his life and his children, you know, the children and, and the way his lifestyle and what he did during the day and everything. But they couldn't account for 22 years of his life in which he was a soldier, a military, uh, he was in the military, and they didn't know anything about it. And he, he had, they knew that he was a prisoner of war in World War II, and he was in a, a, a German concentration, or a POW, a Stalag, yeah. um, but they didn't know anything else, and they had these strange, you know, stories that he, they, they related, which didn't make any sense. Mm. And w luckily, I became friends with a, a retired Pakistani general who was also, uh, you know, a man of the path. And uh, he, Sheikh, uh, General Yusuf, ferreted out, he, he found his entire military record wow. from 1940 Amazing. to 1962 in detail, you know, and he, you know, he said it was like finding a needle in a haystack because he entered the the, uh, the British Indian Army at the age of 17 as a sepoy. That's you know, it would be, would have been very easy to lose all of those files, and he found every single. That's amazing. And you know, one day he said, "I'm having. It's going to take some time, and so on." And then one day I got one uh, document after another, after another, after another, and was able to reconstruct his entire military career, wow. which was significant because th this is where he met his sheikh, his teacher who inspired him. And the, the teacher, the sheikh, was the, the, led a unit that, that made the uniforms for the, his regiment. And um, anyway, there's great stories Amazing. related to that. And that was all from, from General Yusuf's uh, uh, research. And uh, I couldn't, we, it was the pandemic. I, we, couldn't, we couldn't move around or go anywhere. So anyway, it, those were the main things, elements that we, we had to sort of uh, d d cope with. Uh, in, in Thank you for that. We make, uh, we're running late, so I'm going to make this the last question. Jazakumallah uh, khair for providing these resources for us because um, for Amat and Nas, well, the exemplars that we know about, like who are famous, are Ibn Hanbal, Ibn Taymiyyah, uh, in very old days, but today when Sheikh Hamza mentioned that Sheikh uh, Abdullah bin Bayah, um, books his flights based on the prayer times. It's it's nice for us to know about these people of the current time and read about them. Um, however, my question is: um, Are there any plans for us to find these books and other books of Sheikh Hamza on Audible uh, and other resources? Um, I know a lot of videos of Sheikh Hamza are in on YouTube, uh, but sometimes there are in parts and some parts are missing. So it would be very nice if we have it on Audible and some online form so we can listen to them while we are commuting or at any time. Thank you. Yeah, I've actually never listened to an Audible book. I, 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 do I. Yeah, I probably should because a lot of people um, do them. And it used to be the way people read books. I mean, mm. before television, People or the family would gather around and somebody would read from yeah. very common practice. So yeah. I think it's probably something worth re reviving, but I would rather see it done like that where somebody, like yeah. I, somebody, um, a group just, uh, Shema'il and uh, uh, Zain, um, Saadia and Zainab and uh, her husband, they, they drove to Chicago from Michigan, and they read Naqib Ra'tas's book on the way. One, one person wow. read it. Wow. Yeah, and so... And That's the heavy stuff. I know, it's, yeah. <laughs> but, but it's nice to, to do yeah, that. So great. I think that public readings... I actually really enjoyed your reading, by the way. I mean, I, okay. I found it was very moving. I mean, not, you know, I, I, um, I hadn't um, read the, uh, uh, that, that 
the first one. I mean, I, I wrote the second one, but I, I really enjoyed it. And, and yeah. uh, I think it's, it's something that needs to be revived, yeah. you know, public readings. Right. I mean, they used to, you know, you know, 19th century, yeah. I mean, Dickens used to come to America and like yeah. Give, yeah. give public readings and it was yeah. sold out. Right. It's, and I, I think people surprisingly enjoy these things when they actually experience them because yeah. they're, they're so much more interesting. I mean, I always give the example of, you know, people would rather listen to a lousy garage band than, <laughs> than play records because there's just something about live yes. just being mm. there. And mm. um, so I think that's really important. I don't, uh, we're, we're d doing a, um, uh, a studio, please pray for its completion because we have this really brilliant carpenter, but he's only one man and it's actually a really complicated. Uh, I, I had this lady, she's a brilliant Persian architect and she designed a very complicated ceiling. Uh, it's gonna be stunning when it's finished, but it's just really taken a long time. So that's one of the plans when we have the studio done is to, we're gonna be doing online courses and also hopefully uh, have a, a recording studio for doing things like audiobooks and um, doing that we, we plan on uh, publishing, re reissuing Dr. Cleary's Quran, which Inshallah. is one of my favorite um, yeah. translations. It's quite stunning. Yeah. Yeah, so. One, one th thing, I, I, I was approached about doing Audible, but one of the books that I've written as an Audible book, so I had two f old friends from my past life as, a, as an actor, uh, and, and uh, these guys are still in the business, and, and the two, both of them uh, are, are well known for re reading, reading novels yeah. and everything. Yeah. And um, so I, <laughs> I, I contacted one of my friends and I said, uh, look, how, how long does it, t does it take you to record a book of about 350 pages? And I thought he was going to say, well, it takes about a week or something, you know. He said, well, um, it takes me about one day. And if I have to do voices or accents, then maybe a day and a half. And I thought, Amazing. like, I can't go more than, like, I can't record more than, yeah. like, a half an hour before my voice starts to break or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, I just get too tired or distracted. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not an easy thing to do it, but I think it would be great uh, for among our young people for some someone to really learn that craft. It's a, it's yeah, a, it's very and and a really good uh, reader is um, uh, very impressive. Incre yeah. Incredible. I mean, I, I mean, do, Ken Burns has those great uh, narrators in, yeah, in well, his Peter documentaries. Co Peter Coyo Coyote is yeah. one of them. Yeah. They're, they're terrific. Yeah. It's it's an art form. Well, also enunciation has been lost. Yeah, so exactly. So just just because yeah. I mean you had to learn when you in just studying acting. Yeah. You know the marbles in the mouth. I mean yeah. the Shakespearean actors, yeah. the pencils and marbles yeah. in the and, mouth and, and breathing. And breathing. And all that. Yeah. yeah. So no, subhanallah. People yeah. people don't enunciation used to be yeah. part of uh, education. But also tajweed. I mean we yeah. still have tajweed, which yeah. is really interesting, which is yeah. proper enunciation of the yeah. Quran. Uh, well, we had a teacher actually in Egypt of Tajweed, Tajweed who said if you don't make the correct Tajweed, it's not recognizable to Allah. <laughs> <laughs> that was his yeah. thing. A true but, teacher of Tajweed. Right. Yeah. He really believed. Yeah. But, um, but Chris Blovelt, you know, Abdurrahman, Sidi Abdurrahman, he was, because he's plugged into the, a, a younger generation, he said, People don't read anymore, and he said, you, "We we need to they we need to have audible books because everyone's on the on the freeway or driving around mm -hmm. all the time." And he he came up with some statistic. I don't know from from where he got it, but that only something like sixteen percent of young Muslims read. You know, they re read. Sixteen is pretty high. I, I really? I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's not bad. Yeah. Yeah. I hope I, that our students are part of that. <laughs> I mean, I, I've been overwhelmed with the book club just because people are reading the books. I've been really impressed just with the, the book club we've been doing. And I get, on average, like 250, 300 people on the, on the live sessions. Right. And they, they have comments. 
uh, have great questions. I, I've just been really, uh, it's been, been uh, and it's been viewed, I think, several thousand, just the recorded That's ones really on it. So uh, reading, Iqra, I call it the first command club. I mean, yeah. Iqra is, and then the, the most interesting thing to me about reading is you can take a book, like I just, before I came here, I was reading uh, uh, Sidi Ahmed Zarruq's Qawaid al Tasawwuf. Yeah. And uh, and I've been reading that book for 25, 30 yeah, years. Know. You know, it's a just it's incredible. It's un, it's a just, but it's like he puts so much into that book, yeah. and then you've got all that. It's all there for yeah. you, and yeah. and one of the great gifts. And it really bothers me. We really have to restore the radiallahu anhu because a lot of these people. We had a quote, a quote, a colloquium, and I just noticed the students weren't like saying radiallahu yeah, anhu. Yeah. It's really important to 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 pray for the people that gave us so much yes. of, of their lives. Yes, because yes. these are people that sacrificed. I mean, they were up all night. They were they spent years studying, thinking, mm. contemplating, and then their spiritual practice, and and then they gave us. What they yeah. gave us, yes. You know, I mean, that diwan of Sheikh Ibn Al Habib is a masterpiece. Yeah. yeah. Um, so just praying for them is really important. Like yeah. Marat al-Hajj, you know, just to pray yeah. for their souls because yeah. they're elevated with those prayers. Yeah. You know, yeah. and uh, one of the things, um, uh, it's it's a very poignant part of the Purgatorio, is that all the people on Mount Purgatorio they kept saying to to pray for us and tell the people to pray for us when you go back. You know what he's on? Yeah. And, and uh, one of the beauties of our religion is we are probably the last community that, that does that, that says Rahimullah when we mention people's mm -hmm. names who have passed. Yeah. You know, radiallahu anhu, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Alayhi salam, like Isa, alayhi yes, salam. You know, I, I called my, I have this friend of mine, he's a, he's a Christian pastor. He has a, like this mega church in uh, Texas. Okay, yeah, I've heard yeah. of that. And, and so I called him and I asked him about a verse in Genesis. And he knew it, he's really good with the Bible. <clears throat> and, and he said, though, the verse about blessing Abraham. I said, yeah, God says, <clears throat> we will bless the nation that blesses Abraham. And so I said to him, <coughs> Pastor Bob, have you ever blessed Abraham in your life? Hmm. And he said, I can't say that I have. And I said, we, <coughs> we bless him five times a day. Hmm. Yeah. And so maybe you're in the wrong religion. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to pick up on what Sheikh Hamza said earlier about the book club and uh, invite all of those who are not part of the book club all you have to do is become a monthly donor if you're not already a monthly donor to Zaytuna and the 12,000 Strong program. And you can join the book club. The minute you join, you can start the book club and read some books and discuss them with Sheikh Hamza. Um, I think before we wrap it up, I'll ask Sheikh Hamza to kind of close it out with a dua. Uh, Bismillah. Well, yeah, well, just well. A prayer, short prayer. Uh, I would, uh, yeah, you. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. Yeah. Um, First of all, may Allah bless you and your work, and may Allah accept it, and may these stories inspire our young people to set out on their own paths mm -hmm. to the truth, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, elevate all these people that we've been talking about tonight, mm -hmm. give them light in their graves, increase them, mm -hmm. uh, make them uh, intercessors for us on that day when the debts fall due, mm -hmm. and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unite us in our dreams and in our waking states with the righteous and the salihin. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inshallah bless all the people that attended this online and in present. May Allah return you all to your home, salimin ghanimin. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inshallah continue to bless Sidi Harun and all his work and give him a healing and give him uh, uh, light. Uh, in his heart and in his eyes, mm -hmm. inshallah. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless Abladim Sanders um, for the amazing yeah, yeah. work that he did to bring the images of these people to our eyes um, that we yeah. might delight in their faces. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless our mm -hmm. Prophet, sallam, make him 
smile when he sees us. Muqbiran alayna. May he take us by our hands. May we get a drink from the Hald, from his Yad Sharifa. Uh, may we always honor the people of his family. May we always honor the Salihin and the righteous. May Allah give us adab with the awliya and the ulama and the righteous people wherever they are. And may he always put in our hearts humility that we might never look at his creation with contempt. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inshallah uh, bless Zaytuna and the Qaymin and, and make it easy for people in this time Ya Allah we ask you inshallah to, to make it easy uh, bring peace where there's war bring healing where there's suffering bring joy where there's sorrow we ask you to inshallah make us people that do those things make us amongst the righteous and make us those who die with La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah in their tongues, raised up in the presence of the Prophet Sallallahu behind him as our Imam on the Day of Judgment, uh, passing swiftly across the Sirat, entering into his hold and drinking a drink that will have no thirst after. And may Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala inshallah unite us all in Jannah with all of these righteous people. Subhan Rabbika Rabbil Izzati Amma Yasifun Wassalamu Alaikum Wa Rahmatullahi Rabbil Alameen. Thank <laughs> you.